Our next uh, view that we want to look at, the next page, is called Historic Premillennialism. Historic. So this is an older view. And if you are trying to get an image instead of the stopwatch, uh, think of the atomic clock. So uh, this is the timeline of prophecy, and it just never stops ticking. It just keeps ticking, okay? So it's, it's that sort of clock with a timeline that just goes rather consecutively and consistently in its development. If you are um, looking at it graphically, a historic premillennial view, it would establish that Old Testament prophecy uh, did speak of Israel, but it also spoke of God's plan to win the nations. And uh, we'll look at some passages I'll show you in just a little bit, but I think you would recognize some of that. That uh, Romans 15, Paul would say, this is what the prophets prophesied. Um, Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, uh, Peter preaches, this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. Uh, Psalm 117, that God would bring his blessings upon the nations, even the promise to Abraham. So um, historic premillennialism would say, there certainly were Old Testament prophecies that related to Israel, but there were, was always God's intention to spread his grace more broadly through Israel, that there was a, a plan to use that nation to bless the nations. And so as prophecy led to the coming of Christ and the blessing of the Holy Spirit, that God poured out his grace in kingdom, in a kingdom unfolding that then engrafted enfolded the nations, and that's still happening. Now, this time period, obviously, has gone another 2,000 years. So I can't exactly show that graphically, but the presumption of those, very much like dispensational premillennialists, those who are historic premillennialists, recognize that the son of perdition comes, that he hurts his church, that the church goes into apostasy, but it's a much simpler diagram. Again, because you're not storing up all of those prophecies. Rather, they're applying rather in a distributed way. So coming out of the church age is a time of apostasy and persecution and tribulation, at which time Christ returns to rescue his church. There is a rapture. And by the way, all the views have a rapture. Sometimes we forget that. Not all the views have a secret rapture. Okay? All the views believe that God comes and rescues his people out of trouble on the earth. All the views hold that. But it's dispensationalism that has particularly the secret rapture view. But all views believe that Christ comes at some point to rescue his people. And so you see the, the second coming where Christ comes. He comes in this view, not secretly, but it is the visible glorious appearing that immediately follows the tribulation. Then there is a rapture of all believers. There's the establishment of the millennial kingdom. Now, again, for this historic premillennial view, uh, the kingdom is a literal thousand-year reign of God on the earth with his people. And the way it's usually expressed in this premillennial view is God is vindicating the rule of Christ. That is, Christ said that he would come and establish his kingdom and his righteousness, and he literally comes and does that for a thousand years. The other things that happen is those Christians who have been martyred through the ages as well as those who have gone through this tribulation are what are known as vindicated. That their blood, that their suffering, their tears is, what's the right way to say it, balanced out as they are with Christ ruling upon the earth for a thousand year period. And it's the perfect period of Christ's rule. At the end of that time, Satan is released. Again, Satan has his little period. Armageddon occurs as Satan and his troops try to overthrow the millennial kingdom. Christ defeats the resurrection of all occurs. There is the final judgment and the new heavens and the new earth. Now, most of what I've said to you is not new. I mean, you recognize all the pieces. Even, even though they may not have been in the, the order and with the, the relation to Israel that you talked about, you recognize some of the distinctive teachings. Let me look at your sheets for a little bit and we'll talk about some of those distinctions. A distinctive teaching of historic premillennialism is that the covenant of grace is unfolding over time and culminating in Christ. So no parenthetic period, but rather a way in which the covenant is unfolding and increasing, as it were, in clarity and effect over time. 
Historic premillennialism. This becomes very important. Okay, I'll just tell you, this is one of the more important things I'll say tonight is this little bullet right here. Historic premillennialism says there is a coordinated plan of Israel and the church. The Gentiles are engrafted into Israel. Now, why is that language important? You recognize, I think, the language of Romans, where the Apostle Paul talks about the nations being engrafted as Israel itself had become the vine that was not fulfilling its purpose. Strong dispensational thinking does not like that terminology. Okay? If there are separate plans for Israel and the church, then the church is separate from Israel and remains separate from Israel. And the notion that there's a coordinated plan for Israel and the church is sometimes identified by dispensationalists by what is known as replacement theology, that Israel replaces, the, uh, that the church replaces Israel. Now, let me say very clearly, there are some historic premillennialists who do teach that. Okay? And I would say even probably the majority. Okay? They do not use the word replacement. Okay? They say engrafting. That God's promises to Israel are intact, but expanded to include the Gentiles. All right? So very few well-trained scholars would ever say that there is a replacement of Israel with the church. The distinction would be this. Does there remain a separate, definite plan for ethnic Israel? You hear that question? Is there still a separate, definite plan for ethnic Israel? And I will tell you, plain language, historic, premillennialists differ on that subject. Just like dispensationalists differ on some things, historic premillennialists differ on that. Some say there is not a continuing plan for ethnic Israel. Some say there is a continuing plan for ethnic Israel. I am one of those that says there is a continuing plan for ethnic Israel. I can't read Romans 9 and 11 without believing there is a continuing definite plan for ethnic Israel. Now, why do I say that to you? Just, again, plain talk. We're friends here. I said that when I was coming as a candidate here, but I sometimes repeatedly hear that I don't believe that. People simply assume, because I'm a historic premillennialist, that I don't believe that there is a plan for ethnic Israel. And therefore, it sometimes said, you know, Brian does not believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible that there's not a literal plan for Israel. So I don't know how I can say it any plainer. I do believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible. I do believe there's a literal plan for Israel, and I do believe there's a separate plan for ethnic Israel. So you can tell <laughs> if that needs to be said in the settings you're in. It doesn't mean I'm right, but it's my best conclusion, <laughs> okay? There are other people I've said clearly who don't believe it. I think the majority of pre historical pre-mills do not believe that. But clearly, the, the greatest spokesman for historic premillennialism was J. Barton Payne in his book, Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy. And he did believe that there was a separate and definite plan for ethnic Israel. And he was my professor, and I bought it. <laughs> okay? So that's, that's still where I am. And again, I can't read particularly Romans 11 without believing that. Um, the distinctive teaching, I'm still on the bullets here, of historic premillennialism is that there is a real millennium to vindicate Christ's rule and the persecuted church. That is real, meaning really a thousand years, okay? That there is this millennial period that God establishes. Is it a literal thousand years or is it a perfect time of, 10, of a thousand years? I'm not sure. But there is a real millennium that God establishes on the earth. And again, that a rapture accompanies the second coming. Now, let me say it again. Every view holds that a rapture occurs at the second coming that God takes his people to himself to rescue them. Every view holds that. But millennialism, excuse me, dispensationalism sometimes is the only view that people think believes in the rapture because it believes in the secret rapture, okay? A, a, a primary rapture before the final rapture. But every view believes in a rapture. They may not use that terminology, but every view believes that Christ comes at some point to physically rescue his people. Key influences and development. You see, the very early church taught historic premillennialism. These names may not mean anything to you. Irenaeus, Polycarp, Justin Martyr, Papias. It goes way back to the very early centuries of the church. The institutions of dominant thought where you say, where was this view kind of taught in North America? A place like Fuller, which is the largest evangelical seminary. Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Again, one of the largest evangelical seminaries. Covenant, which is not one of the largest evangelical seminaries, but where I certainly had a lot of background. Key names, 
And the reason I list these key names is to say, I want you to recognize people you trust. To not just suddenly kind of say, you know, these, these are apostatized, terrible people. You recognize these names, and these are people you trust for being Bible-believing people, even though they may disagree with your view of the, of the end times. George Eldon Land, one of the great New Testament theologians. Walter Martin. So most of us know Walter Martin from his books, Kingdom of the Cults, right? So during the 70s through the 90s, one of the major writers kind of warning and helping the church deal with the thriving of cults in North America. The great apologist, John Warwick Montgomery, one of the great fighters for the integrity and truth and the inerrancy of Scripture. R. Laird Harris, one of the founders of the Evangelical Theological Society, the author of the Theological Word Book of the Old Testament, J. Barton Payne, the author of the Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy. So these are names you know. They are, they are trustworthy names. They would hold to a historic premillennial view. If you say what are their key passages, passages that they would go to, and they say, this is why I believe that there is a literal thousand-year millennium that follows a prophesied engrafting of the Gentiles. Again, not believing in the parenthetic age, but believing that there was an intention of the prophets to see the Gentiles engrafted. And I've simply listed the passages. If you look closely, you'll see those are some of the same passages that others have already identified. And it's because, again, that presupposition that drives sometimes the interpretation. Did the Old Testament prophets foresee the engrafting of the nations, or did they not? And if you did believe they do, then some of those passages become very important for you in saying, here is this atomic clock unfolding in a much more consecutive way. The view of Revelation, how do we interpret biblical prophecy, and particularly the book of Revelation? Um, the scholars who basically hold to a historic premillennial view would all say they believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible. No one would deny that. They would all say, I believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible. They would say that means I believe in a natural interpretation, which means it is as literal as the context makes appropriate to determine whether or not symbolism was intended. So instead of saying, I'm literal and you're not, they would say, no, a proper interpretation of literal is to look at things in context. And certainly some things were meant to be symbolic. Examples would be already the lamb, I've said. Do you believe the lamb of Revelation 5 is a, you know, ba lamb? And, and I'm not sure I could do that again. But anyway, um, but, I mean, you believe that's Christ. Do you believe Babylon is the now defunct city in Iraq? Or do you think Babylon is the representation of the coalition of evil in the world? And my guess is you tend to believe the opposite, that, 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 that you believe it is the coalition of evil in the world, symbolically, as you get to the book of Revelation. Both dispensationalism and historic premillennialism tend to look at the book of Revelation as a um, coordinated and chronological timeline. This leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. So we tend to read the book of Revelation chronologically. Um, we'll see in a little bit, not everybody does it that way. So, um, again, if it's helpful, I've said this since I came as a candidate. This is my view, the one you're looking at right now. Okay, so, you know, no, no need to cover that from you. That's what I've said since I came. Uh, it's not the majority view in evangelicalism. It says, I read the scripture, the one I think is most accurate. Okay, so that's uh, um, where, where I am if you feel that becomes important. 